For all you members of the PC Master Race, grab your chocobos and start naming gods to summon. Final Fantasy has made it to Windows. I'll be talking about the story last, so you can avoid spoilers in the first half. First, the good points. Not only is the download only $50, but you also get all of the DLC and a few bonus items. These include a 50% discount for hotels, a bunch of outfits, and some mid-level weapons that will make the first part of the game go by quite fast. Secondly, the styling is gorgeous. You have the Matrix-style outfits from the 90s, modern phones, magic tech armor, swords and crystal spires, flying ships, and a classic-looking car in the regalia. The only word that could describe it all is Z-Rust. The dated elements actually make it look futuristic. Run it in 120 FPS and maximum resolution, it's drop-dead gorgeous. On the bad side, loading. There is a very long load time before and after each cutscene, and when entering or leaving any dungeon, or when fast traveling. Worse, there's no click to proceed, so you actually have to be there when the loading bar finishes to not miss the next intro. The loading bar is idiosyncratic too, so you can't just estimate how much time you have to run to the fridge. Install it on a solid state drive if you have room. Secondly, product placement. I have never seen such blatant and abundant product placement as I have in this game. The main crew has Coleman camping gear, including the Lolo. Seriously, Ignis cooks on my dad's camp stove. Then there's the cup noodles. Oh, there's an entire quest dedicated to cup noodles. And the writing is so blatantly written as an advertisement that it has its own entry under Narm Charm in TV Tropes. Luna's wedding dress is more integrated into the plot, but it's obviously being shilled for the designer. Thirdly, the controls are just off for a PC game. Run isn't shift, it's E, which also shares some functionality with left's mouse clip, mostly causing you to re-enter into discussions, chocobos, or the car as you're trying to quickly move away. Items are T. Group commands are control, and the kingly magic super attack is G. It's clearly mapping controller inputs in semi-random ways. Then the save mechanics are quite frustrating. While it doesn't technically use save points, you can't save in a dungeon or in critical areas, so it has much of the same effect. This is especially nasty in two dungeons which can take hours to traverse without a save point. It would be horrible to get to the end and then have a power blip. Fourthly, a few characters are a little too heavy on the fan service. Cindy's outfit is obviously based on Daisy Duke, and the camera lingers a bit too long at times. But Shiva's outfit is not going to be seen at conventions. It's best described as a thong, gauze, and strategically positioned jewelry. Finally, the regalia. The car is simultaneously the best and worst thing of the game. The game has a nasty habit of throwing huge numbers of side quests at you, then having you drive halfway across the map to get there. It's only a few miles, and the car goes roughly 40 miles an hour before upgrades. However, that's in real time. If you can't fast travel to a location, and you can only fast travel to designated parking spaces that you've gone to before, then you're either going to be doing fairly dull driving mechanics, or sitting and waiting while Ignis drives you for five or six real-world minutes. In fact, I've written most of this script while in loading screens, or while Ignis is driving the regalia. It's an absolutely beautiful game, but it takes way too much time getting between places. Now the spoiler section. I'm not going to touch too much on the story, but I'll agree with other commenters that while the connection between our male leads is genuine, the love story between Prince Emo and Lady Not Zelda isn't exactly the best. 
it also suffers from lunar narrative distance, worse than any game I've played since Bioshock Infinite. The story pushes you to go forward extremely fast. It's a matter of life and death for the fate of the world. However, if you want to actually be able to succeed, you need to fulfill a lot of trivial side quests to level up. These include hunting, fishing, taking photos, and harvesting vegetables. Furthermore, the story is just short. After the open world, you have a series of linear story missions and aren't allowed to explore the world anymore, even while traveling the world or after the calamity, unlike FF6, 8, 9, and I don't know how many others. In the classic games, you'd have gotten to participate in all the actions as the world falls apart around you. Here, you're late to the party. To get any side missions done, you pull a Barry Allen and go back in time to the open world segment of the game. This cheapens the repeated player punches in the story, as you can simply return to before all the sacrifices had to be made, characters die, others become handicapped, and your beloved car gets smashed to pieces? Who cares? Just time work backwards and go hunt some monsters. It even gets a bit tiny-whiny, as a lot of side quests can only be done this way as they require abilities and items from the end game, but no characters comment on it. As a game, I would definitely suggest it. While it's not perfect, it is one of the better Final Fantasy games. While sometimes obviously a port, it's not filled with game-breaking glitches like that often implies. For those who don't have the game on PlayStation, this is an excellent buy. Once you account for the DLC, it's half the price of anything equivalent on Steam. Even if you do already have it, the 120 frames per second and higher resolution may prove tempting. So, that's Final Fantasy XV for Windows. Please let me know what you think in the comments down below. And thanks for listening, y'all.